Okay, Norman Lamb, Health Minister in the Coalition Government, is now here to answer your points. The first of those comes from Abdulaziz. Where's Abdulaziz? There he is. What do you want to ask? Hi. We all know that Nicolik broke his promise on their tuition fees. If he couldn't keep a promise to the students, how can we trust him to keep a promise to the entire country? Thank you. Right. Let me de deal with it head on. Uh, we made a massive mistake. Um, actually, I suspect that all of us in our lives make mistakes. Uh, I've, no, we do, but we do, we do. And look, I've, I've openly apologised for this. Uh, I really regret doing it because actually uh, trust in politics is quite low. Uh, but for me, it's really important. Uh, and we should never have done that. But I suppose what I'd say to you is, uh, we entered a coalition, we had to negotiate, we got what we thought was the best deal we could. And if you actually look at the policy now, the way it's working, we've got, I think it's 9% more students from poorer backgrounds going to university. Record numbers applied for university this year. We've managed to maintain the funding of universities so that they can compete on a world stage. Uh, and I was really interested, there was a student uh, leader, uh, a, 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 a union leader, on the radio the other night and she said uh, I really opposed this when it came in but now I wouldn't get rid of it because actually uh, it's forced universities to listen to students Stu students have power now they can say we demand better uh, from you and the way it's your the repayments work is it's based entirely on your ability to pay so the wealthy banker pays a lot more uh, it, for their education but someone on a low income as a graduate pays less than under the previous system and as a progressive politician who believes in paying according to your ability to pay I think that's a good thing. Okay, I think we're going to talk more about tuition fees but I guess really we're talking more broadly about about trust. No, uh, yeah, sure. Gentleman here. My question was about tuition fees actually. Just to point on that point, do you really think that having a little bit more influence in the student union is worth six grand a year? Well, <laughs> but, First, first of all, you pay nothing up front. Uh, so the, the sort of accusation at the time that this would put a lot of people off going to university, it hasn't been borne out because there are record numbers now applying. And the repayments, as I said, are based on your ability to pay. So if you do very well as a graduate, if you become a lawyer or a banker or whatever, yes, you will pay a lot more for your uh, education. But if you're on a low income, perhaps as a care worker or something in those... Uh, professions, you pay less than you did under the old system. It's, it's what we call progressive, according to your ability to pay. And when you reach retirement, if you haven't earned enough to pay back the full amount, then it gets written off. Uh, and so it's like a graduate tax, uh, but it, I think, strengthens the bond between the, the, the student and the university, forcing universities to listen to students about the sort of education that they want. Okay, uh, yeah, gentlemen here. Hi, I'm a student at UEA, and I understand that because you're the junior party, you may not be able to get all your you know, legislation, sure. you may not do, but the point is you signed a pledge in front of the National Union sure. of Students, so, you know, you promised, and now I've got to pay 44 grand. <laughs> Cheers. That's about yeah. it. No, look, I, I completely recognise we made a, a big mistake on that, but... Also, just what I suppose I'd say to you is, judge us in the round. Look at what we've actually done. Uh, so in this government, for example, one of the main pledges we made in our manifesto uh, was that we would cut tax for people on low and middle incomes. We've delivered that. We've actually gone further than we said uh, we would try to do during this parliament. We've achieved a significant tax cut for people on low pay. We also said... And this, for me, is a really important thing. We said that we would commit two and a half billion pounds to students from the poorest backgrounds in, ed in schools in order to ensure that you narrow the attainment gap uh, in education. We've delivered that, two and a half billion pounds this year, going to students from the poorest uh, backgrounds. That's thing. really worthwhile. OK. Uh, no, yeah, go on. Uh, no, I was going to say, um, the thing is that students used to be a massive demographic of your vote. Nick Clegg is in a constituency where sure. there's a university. So, you know, I can't see how he's probably going to be re-elected, considering... Well, look, uh, we, we, uh, we've taken a hit, there's no doubt about that. But I, I honestly think that we've acted in the national interest. We were in a very, very dangerous situation as a country. 
in 2010. We had a deficit, you know, we were spending more than we were bringing in taxes, something akin to Greek levels, Portuguese levels. Now, we're the fastest growing economy in the G7. Uh, we've got uh, record levels of employment for our own people, as, as well as people who are coming to this country. I was hearing your discussion earlier. So record levels of employment and a reduction in youth unemployment. So, you know, I think there are many things that we've achieved during that period through very, very difficult times. If, as this gentleman says, Nick Clegg doesn't win his seat, would you run for leader? <laughs> uh, I keep getting asked this. All I've said, uh, look, I, I'm, first of all, I think Nick has uh, done an incredible job, actually, in this parliament. He's taken an enormous amount of personal abuse, as his family has, but he's always borne it with good grace. He came onto your programme, I think, before yeah. Christmas, faced up to people uh, on tuition fees and everything else. Uh, Not today, though. Not today, but I'm here, so uh, you'll have to put up with me. And uh, so what was but, your answer? Look, no, if at some stage, <laughs> it's a fair challenge, if at some stage a vacancy arises, and I, as I suspect it will, I will consider it. I haven't, I honestly, <laughs> no, look, I honestly haven't made a decision. I've got, I've got a family. I've got, we've got two sons in their 20s. Uh, it has an impact on your family. It can be quite brutal, this job. Uh, I've got to work out whether that's something that I would actually want to do. It's not something I'm ruthlessly ambitious for, sure. but I would consider it. But you, and you suspect enough. that the vacancy will arise. Uh, Tina, uh, yes. any, any comments on trust? Uh, Steve Pass from Wirral, first of all. Why should we believe anything Lib Dems say now after the U-turn on tuition fees after the last election? Mm -hmm. The hashtag we're using is Ask Lib Dems. Kay Vaughan, why should students really trust you again? Really? They've used really twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this one from Sarema. We understand that you made a mistake. You've admitted that. Now, how are you going to fix it? Well, okay. I'd come back. <laughs> I'd come back to what I said earlier. Record numbers applying for university. Uh, repayments based on your ability to pay. Universities receiving the same level of funding as they were so that they can compete on the world stage. Had we not done this, universities would actually have had a cut in their, uh, in their budgets, which would have meant fewer students going to university. That would have been a disastrous thing for our country. So instead of that, we've strengthened the bond between the student and the university. We've got record numbers, including more students from poorer backgrounds. Today. So look, I think yeah. we made a, we, I repeat again, we made a dreadful mistake. We should never have done it. But actually what we've ended up with is a system that is based on your ability to pay as a graduate and stops no cost, one from going to university. At what cost is the Lib Dem brand damaged now? Oh, look, it, uh, I face up to this. It's been damaged, no doubt about that. I suppose what I'd just say to you is, judge us in the round. Look at the fact that uh, we cut tax for people on low pay, that we've got more funding into schools for students from the poorest backgrounds. And I, what I find really inspiring when I go to schools in North Norfolk, so I'm close to UEA uh, where you are, when I talk to head teachers and they say to me we're using the pupil premium which is the, the this is the money that goes to students from poorest backgrounds and we are narrowing the attainment gap. These youngsters from lower income backgrounds who traditionally in this country just do not get a fair chance. They are now getting a chance and schools are held to account for how they use that money. I'm really inspired by that. OK, I want to take a question now from Adam Shaw. Where's Adam? Adam. Yes, what do you want to ask, Adam? Um, I'm a Lib Dem Party member, and I'll be voting for the party on May the 7th. Um, my concern at the moment is that we seem to define ourselves by what we're not, Labour or Tory, rather than what we are. I yep. just wonder if you think that's the best way to fight the campaign. So not left, not right, I guess. Sure. No, I understand that. Well, look, I do it in my own way. I'm a, I'm a liberal, and I believe in giving people opportunity and, and, indeed, freedom. And I think one of the things that I'm proudest of that we've done in this government is to legislate for gay marriage. I think it's a fantastic thing. Uh, and the fact now that people who, who happen to be attracted to people of their own sex can have the same opportunity as everyone else to marry and to have a happy life together to commit to one another, I think is something we should absolutely celebrate. And we've done it as Liberals, and we should be very proud of it. OK. Uh, gentleman here. Would, would you not consider reinvesting some of the money which you get donated to your party 
in helping those who are the very worst off. If I'm going to go to university for four years, there will be £36,000 that I will never see. So... Sure, well, look, well, on your first point, uh, I'm just about to keep my water over. Uh, on, my, on your first point, I desperately want to see reform of party finance. It, it is an outrage what happens in this country, and I think it corrupts the political process. We have tried throughout this parliament to try and get agreement across the parties to limit donations to political parties. Conservatives won't agree. They rely on very large donors. Uh, Labour won't agree because they rely on trade unions. The public won't stomach the idea of increased uh, state funding of parties. So let's just limit the amount that individuals can pay uh, so that we clean up the political process and end this awful uh, link between finance and people getting into the House of Lords. That's a dreadful thing. And that it stains the political process and reduces trust uh -huh. in politicians. The largest okay. single donation to your party is from a now convicted criminal yeah, of no, £2.4 million. Pounds. I, I, I can't afford that. <laughs> I, should, I, I should say, incidentally, that he was, he's been convicted since that donation. We had no idea at the time uh, that he was uh, a criminal. Uh, but I come back to my point. We are arguing the case for a form of party finance. It's an outrageous system okay. which enables parties to buy seats. If, you, if I look around the country at the moment, the Conservatives are spending a fortune in trying to win seats from the Lib Dems. They are doing weekly uh, mail shots from headquarters. We can't begin to spend that amount of money on buying seats. And that's, that corrupts the political process, in my view. OK, I want to take a question now from Ewan Atkinson. Where's Ewan? Ewan. <laughs> yeah, over here, looking right at you. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Um, only 13% of your MPs are women. Why do you not have more women MPs other than because no one really wants to vote for your party? <laughs> <laughs> that last week was, bit was a bit unfair. <laughs> but, uh, look, our, our parliamentary party is horribly unrepresentative uh, and we've got a load of work to do to uh, change that. I personally believe in uh, positive action. Uh, to increase the number of women. There are, there are different sort of s approaches you can take. Uh, one idea, for example, is to take a group of winnable seats and to say that 50% of the candidates in these winnable seats uh, should be women. Uh, but I think there needs to be something that changes the status quo because we've got to somehow represent modern Britain, both in terms of gender but also in terms of ethnic uh, backgrounds, and we don't at the moment. OK, uh, yeah, a lady here at the back. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, in relation to the fact that tuition fees have gone up, as you said, for more prestigious degrees such as law, what about students from poorer backgrounds that you were also talking about? Don't you think that deters...? Uh, I think we've done enough oh, on right. tuition fees, so I think we'll, we'll try and keep it on representation. I'll uh, talk to you uh, afterwards. Lady here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, would you consider implementing quotas then to ensure that there are a sufficient number of female MPs? Well, I, I'm, look, I'm open-minded to all sorts of ideas. Uh, I, I just think that the party has to confront the fact that all of the approaches that we've taken haven't worked. Uh, and I fundamentally believe that uh, Parliament would be far better if it was more representative of modern Britain, but our party needs to do that as well. OK. Uh, so yeah. I would certainly consider it, is the answer. I don't, have a, I don't have a sort of fixed view about the best solution. I would like to discuss it with others, but something needs to be done to change the status quo. OK. Uh, yeah, lady here. Um, do you not think that introducing quotas is just a convoluted way of solving this? Wouldn't it be better to just assess someone on the job and how many of each gender are applying and use those ratios? <laughs> The difficulty, we, we're a democratic party, so in each seat, uh, the members of the party in that area uh, elect the candidate to represent them in the election. Uh, and, you know, as a Liberal party, we don't uh, particularly agree with sort of imposing something from the centre. That's the sort of tension that we've got, but we've got to find some way of ensuring that women get a fair chance uh, to get elected to Parliament. And we have, we have failed on that in the past, but... I believe that's why I believe something needs to change. But they also okay. need Couple to do it in their own right, not just because you're a female I, and we need I, to I, do I totally agree with that, but there are, do, do lot, there are a hell of a lot of tal ta very talented women who would make brilliant MPs within our party. Yeah. 
That's what needs to change. Thank okay. You. Uh, Just want to get a couple of comments you, in now. Francis says, Norman Lamb not doing a very good job at telling us what the Lib Dems stand for except gay marriage. And this well, I'll, one... I'll be very happy to tell you more. This one, first of all, from Tory Swing, we need more women in Parliament anyway, but the Liberal Democrat statistics are particularly shameful. And in the last Parliament, you had zero BME candidates, black or minority ethnic candidates. And, uh, no, MP, we, did, well, MP, we, didn't, we didn't have zero. We had, lots of, we had lots of BME candidates, but we didn't get candidates elected. That was the problem. Let me just quickly respond to that point uh, on what else makes me a Liberal. Look, I am responsible for mental health policy. Uh, I am passionate in making the case for equality for those who suffer from mental uh, ill health. Uh, we are introducing the first ever waiting time standards in mental health from this very week. Uh, it's uh, outrageous that someone who suffers from uh, suspected cancer gets a right to see a specialist within two weeks. But a youngster, for example, who suffers a first episode of psychosis has no such right. That is outright discrimination. And we are ending that. And, I, and, and for me, that's all about my liberalism. It's about freedom and opportunity to live your life to the full. And at the moment, it's denied to too many people because of mental ill health. OK, I think we've got a question from Josh Smith, who's on the NHS. Where's Josh? Where's Josh? There he is. I mean, Hi. my eyes today. Hello, terrible. Josh. Sorry. Hi, Norman. As a paramedic, I see the good that the NHS does on a daily basis and believe no profit should be made by corporations from the mis people's misfortune. If you got into a coalition government with the Conservatives, how would you hold them to accountable for the NHS and keep it for not-for-profit? OK. So... I passionately believe in the NHS. It's, sort of, it's what I've always campaigned for. Uh, and uh, we rely on the NHS as a family. Uh, and it's a vital institution for this country. So, uh, as a minister, I've made the case for equality for mental ill health. And that's an area where actually the NHS falls short, in my view. Uh, but we need extra investment. And actually, the Lib Dems are the only party that has so far committed to meeting the £8 billion shortfall that all of the experts say will emerge by 2020. Do we need, do we need um, more money put into it or do we need to make the NHS more efficient? Because we, at the end of the day, what we're doing in the NHS is spending the electorate's money, hard-earned money. I That's totally agree. We, so we, we need Let's to become more efficient before we plow more okay. money into it. You're absolutely right. We need to do both. <coughs> so Simon Stevens, the, who's the chief executive of NHS England, uh, said in a report before Christmas that the total funding gap by 2020 will be something like £30 billion. It's pretty horrific, but that we'll need, we would need all other things being equal to spend another £30 billion in a year on the NHS. So he reckons that by improving the efficiency of the way the NHS operates, you could possibly reduce that gap to £8 billion, but still you would need uh, a, a, an additional investment in order to make sure that it's sustainable. So you've got to do both. OK, gentlemen here. Um, you, the general said that the Tories, you, you need to hold them, hold them to account for the privatisation of the NHS, but it was actually Labour who introduced the PFI deals, and they only introduced it because uh, the European Union told them to. So surely you and the Tories should do what you said you would both do and give the people a democratic choice on their membership <laughs> of the European Union so we can take, <laughs> so we can take control of our own NHS. Well, let me deal with the first point very quickly, the PFI deals. I mean, uh, Labour talks a lot about privatisation. This is the biggest privatisation of all. It's mortgaged the future of the NHS to the tune of about £86 billion. And it was all about keeping it off the balance sheet so that it didn't show as public spending. I'm not sure, actually, it had much to do with the European Union. But the extent to which it has mortgaged the future of the NHS is just scandalous. Uh, and it's, it, the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital is a case in point, and it has a massive impact on the local health system. On the question of Europe, uh, we've actually legislated in this Parliament that uh, whenever there will be a significant shift of powers from the UK to the European Union, we would have a referendum. That's now enshrined in legislation. That's not what you said you'd do. You, you said you would give us a referendum if elected, and you, you are in government. So why hasn't that happened? Well, look, uh, we, we've legislated f for any shift of power from this country to give people a say, in effect, in whether we stay in the European Union as, as the proposed uh, uh, 
reform uh, put, puts forward. So at that point, people have their say about whether we stay in a reformed Europe or we leave. And I, I believe it's right that people should have that say. OK. Uh, yeah, gentleman here. Uh, I don't think you can really talk about the, uh, about the European Union or how much you know about it, given that... Uh, just in the debates between Nigel Farage and Nick Clegg last year, uh, Nick Clegg called an EU army a dangerous fantasy. And yet, just in the last few weeks, we've seen John Cla uh, Jean Claude Juncker uh, calling for a European army and calling for a greater, intro a greater militarisation of the European Union. So, what's you know, your question? Was that well? I was, um, so Doesn't matter. Okay, next, <laughs> next. <laughs> I think I feel a common theme that's coming up is um, people don't really seem to trust. And speaking as a young person, I know a lot of young people don't trust their local MPs because they feel that they can't relate to them. And I was just wondering how you expect young men and women from all different cultures to relate to such a male, pale and stale party. <laughs> First, first of all, that's a very good line. Uh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I've already accepted that we need to change. We have very many ethnic minority members, uh, but we need to get them into positions of power in the party. That's what has to uh, change, in my view. Uh, but uh, it comes back to this question of trust. And, uh, and the political classes in this country uh, have, to a large degree, lost the trust of the British people. Uh, but... Uh, when I do my work in North Norfolk, I think that people feel that they trust me. Not everybody, but I, I try never to promise to achieve results. I promise to try to do my very best to achieve outcomes for people. But I think it's much better if you're straightforward and honest about the limits of what you can achieve and then try your very best to achieve them. Uh, and that's the way I think you start to rebuild trust in politics. OK. Tina? Let's go to Redditch for our first comment. You couldn't hold the Tories to account in a first term. You've got no chance in a second. And this one from Iwayaki in Bristol. The NHS is being privatised behind our backs and the Lib Dems haven't done enough to stop it. No wonder UKIP is gaining well, ground. Well, uh, there's all this talk of privatisation. Actually the percentage of the NHS budget spent on in the private sector has gone up, I think, from 4.5% to 6%. So this is a tiny minority of the amount of money. All the rest being spent on uh, NHS providers within the NHS. And uh, my view is that we just need to ensure that we get the best possible care for people. That's what we should focus on. High standards of care. And, you know, I visited a... Uh, so, so tuition fees were a mistake? Was NHS reform a mistake as well? Uh, look, I, I've, I've never been a great enthusiast for uh, Andrew Lanzi's reforms, uh, but they did, when they were amended during the passage through Parliament, they secured in legislation for the first time the idea, the principle of integrating care, joining up care. And, you know, you, you work in the NHS. I think we have to join up the health and social care system uh, it's crazy to have a great divide down uh, the middle. Uh, and I think if you can uh, pool the budget so that you have a single amount of money uh, to spend on health and care, then you will achieve much better outcomes. OK, I want to squeeze in one last question, if I can, from Alexia. Where's Alexia? Everyone point for me, because I can't find anyone today. There we go. Um, if you were to go into another coalition, what would your red line policies be? OK, so red line, basically deal breakers. OK. So what we're doing is, uh, where are you? Sorry, sorry. Stop it. What we're doing is setting out what our priorities are for the next parliament. So the first thing on the front page of the manifesto will be equality for mental ill health. And the investment we've announced today, three and a half billion pounds extra investment over the next five years to achieve that equality, but also investment in the NHS to make sure that it's sustainable. Secondly, that we would... Uh, ensure that we maintain the funding of schools through to colleges. Uh, the Conservatives are proposing at the moment a real terms cut in funding. I think that's a disastrous uh, proposal uh, in terms of the future of our country and the future of our uh, young people. We're also proposing that we must complete the task of uh, clearing the deficit but also ensuring that we continue to cut tax for people on low and middle incomes by another £400 by the end of the next Parliament. These are the principles, the 
priorities that the Lib Dems have for the next parliament. So those are your, those are your red lines, well, those are deal breakers for a coalition they're, they're, agreement? I don't think it's sensible. We got into an awful mess. We've talked about it uh, a lot, about tuition fees. Let's not get into a situation where we make uh, pledges that we end up breaking. We have learned that lesson. We will set out what our priorities are to the British people. Uh, the more uh, people vote for those pr principles and priorities, the more Lib Dem MPs get elected, the more we will see those implemented in government. That's the approach we take. We will then respect the uh, decision of the British people, negotiate uh, with whoever is the okay. largest party to try to secure stability. Quick yes-no answer last... to this one. Could you ever see yourself going back into coalition with the Tories, yes or no? We would act in the national interest. We would try... I'm not a tribal... Yes, yes or no? <laughs> yes or no? We've run out I, of time. I'm not a tribal politician. I will work with other people to achieve the things that I believe in. OK, fair enough. Uh, that is it from us for now.